Welcome and bon appetit. This is Timeless Wisdom with Hazem Kira. And welcome to the episode on political geography. This is actually the second episode on six ways to take over the world. In each episode on the show, we will discuss ideas, ideas born from both halves of our diminutive planet by our world's greatest thinkers, controversial and influential figures. So, last time we discussed the first way to take over the world was Ratzel's organic theory. Ladies and gentlemen, second way to take over the world, Alfred T. Mahan's sea power theory. So, ladies and gentlemen, number two way to take over the world, as mentioned, is the Alfred T. Mahan sea power theory. Forget, as we saw in the clip, forget trying to control the world through merely having a strong um, land base and, and air force base, air base, air, excuse me, air power. No, according to Alfred T. Mahan, you need to have a strong navy. And he looks at the British and he sees that at that time they are the preeminent world power at the time and they have the strongest navy that allows them to basically go to almost anywhere in the world and have access to both commerce which is trade and business as well as security so the british can go anywhere colonize and basically because they have access to the sea so alfred t mahan argues in his book, and the book is important to remember, is called The Influence of Sea Power Upon History. Another, uh, you know, Theodore Roosevelt will read his book. He himself, by the way, Roosevelt wrote his own book uh, about um, Navy power and so forth, very well respected, but Alfred T. Mahan, T. Mahan wrote uh, the preeminent book on it, and so Theodore Roosevelt have had a great deal of respect for this admiral, this Navy admiral, and uh, and in fact took his ideas and suggestions and implemented them when he became president. Uh, and even before then, when he was the Secretary of the Navy, Roosevelt helped create America's strongest, uh, a modern Navy, uh, which became the strongest Navy eventually in the world. So because Roosevelt took the advice of Mahan, Admiral Mahan, um, by the time we enter the Spanish-American War in 1898, we now have what's called the Great White Fleet, um, and actually we are able to go and basically defeat the Spanish, who had their own armada at, at that point, but they didn't have the modern navy as we did, um, and we were able to defeat the Spanish, one of the great powers of a time, in five months, take over much of the territory just in five months. So because we had the modern modern navy, uh, I believe one battle, if I'm correct, between the Spanish and the American fleet lasted 18 plus or minus minutes. So, um, and I believe this was actually the shortest war uh, that America has ever been in. So, and that is again um, as a result of taking advice of Admiral Mahan to take over, to have a strong navy at the time. Um, so, this again was called the Great White Fleet, and later on we will see it in uh, Admiral T. Mahan argued that one of the greatest perils was what he called the Yellow Peril first being the Chinese and then being the Japanese. Of course, very racist, very stereotypical, um, but it was called the Yellow Peril. So the Great White Fleet, the goal was to control both the Caribbean and the Pacific, and eventually the Atlantic, but first was the Caribbean and Pacific. So the United States, the goal was, um, you know, the Europeans have the Atlantic, so but we can still take the Caribbean and the Pacific. The problem, of course, is that the Japanese who are beginning to become industrialized and militaristic, see America trying to take over much of the um, much of the Pacific as a threat and as a rival to its own uh, prowess. Now, at this time, Japan 
literally just defeated the largest country in the world, Russia, in, I believe, 1906-1907 in the Russo-Japanese War. So Japan was beginning to modernize and militarize, and a few years later, we're going to go into China, uh, the largest country in terms of population, and take a large part, uh, I believe, of co what's called the um, one of the large provinces in China. Um, so ja Japan begins to see Alfred T. Mahan's um, hope to have all these naval bases. And of course, in 1898, we have Hawaii, and we put Pearl Harbor under Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt, um, or at least at his behest. And we began to have naval bases all the way to the Philippines. And eventually, you know, right next door, as we know, is Japan and, of course, China right off this coast. So we are becoming the preeminent power in the Pacific and as well, of course, in the Caribbean. One of the other issues, very interesting, that Alfred T. Mahan argued for was to have um, a inter-ocean inter uh, canal in Central America. Um, and so Theodore Roosevelt, when he becomes president, says, hey, Colombia, do you mind if we go ahead and build a canal um, in this area of your, of Colombia called Panama? And Colombia says, thanks, but no thanks. Roosevelt, insisting, uh, actually helps to uh, arm and support a rebellion of Panamanians, Panamanian Colombians, um, who eventually basically uh, claim independence from Colombia. And the United States under Roosevelt says, look, uh, leave Panamanians alone, otherwise you're going to have to deal with us. So Colombia leaves the Panama alone. And of course, one of the first things that Panama does is agree with Roosevelt, sign, I believe, a hundred year deal that, or a number of years, that uh, the United States will have access to and create called the Panama Canal, connecting the Atlantic Ocean with the Pacific Ocean. So rather than the United States or any ship going all the way around, all the way around South America, um, or all the way around the Americas, uh, it wastes a great deal of gas and time. So now this canal will connect um, and allow for greater commerce and um, military, um, military access. So that's the third thing actually Alfred T. Mahan encourages and that is the building of a canal between the two and that is another accomplishment of President Teddy or Theodore Roosevelt. It's very interesting if you look at the size of the Navy um, early on, this is about you know 1898, 1900s plus or minus, we have very few boats and ships. We are beginning to build this great white fleet. Eventually, um, you know, Americans after a few years of imperialism are getting a little tired and they're beginning to go back to neo-isolationism. They're sick and tired of um, trying to take over islands and colonize and so they're beginning to loosen they're beginning to revert back to sort of neo-isolationism until world war one where we began to rebuild uh and to start building again america's navy and we began to see in just in two years during world war one we build from 245 ships all the way to 774 at the peak of or the end of world war one and of course, um, we began to see um, a bit of a decline, but relatively speaking, we still have a number of boats. And, um, but where we begin to see a very sharp increase is with World War II. Uh, with World War II, uh, of course, this is about the time that 1940 or 1939, I believe, 40, um, about 41, that's right, December, 7th, 1941, plus or minus, uh, Japan attacks Pearl Harbor. Uh, of course, this is the naval weapons station base in Hawaii, Hawaii. And um, the goal of the Japanese fleet at that time was to destroy our Pacific fleet. We have an Atlantic fleet and a Pacific. And the goal was to literally destroy 
or sufficiently cripple. And while they did not destroy the Pacific Fleet, they actually did cripple and it took a while to get back and build. But as you can see, America's building and manufacturing capacity is exponential. And by the end of World War II, uh, we'll have over nearly 7,000 ships. Um, one of the Japanese general, when they attacked Pearl Harbor, said, we have awoken a sleeping giant because with the attack on Pearl Harbor, um, we have awoken a sleeping giant, a giant that has great capacity, manufacturing capacity, industrial capacity. And uh, America, of course, then basically will dominate the Pacific um, up until the current, until the present. Currently, there are rivals for the power of the Pacific, including China and um, other Pacific uh, powers, but especially China is, in a sense, there is more rivalry with the United States. And so that's why we have allies with Japan, but even there, that is insufficient to stop or curtail, curb uh, China's growing influence in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, interestingly, though, we see that currently, or the best, you know, the earliest case, 2009, we had about 283, basically about the same as the beginning of World War I. So what happened? Why do we not care as much about our naval weapons, uh, our naval um, uh, our ships, having as many ships, and that's because we have other things that complement, including a very strong Air Force, the strongest in the world. Um, we also have other weapons like nuclear weapons, and so America has less influence and ne less uh, interest in Alfred T. Mahan's naval state, uh, the sea power theory. Um, so we also see here with a shrinking submarine fleet um, and so on and so forth. So, ladies and gentlemen, just as a recap, Alfred T. Mahan said this is a second, second way to rule the world, control the oceans, control the seas, and you will facilitate greater commerce, trade, um, and you'll be able to control the seas and ultimately have greater dominance and control of the world. And again, a great example of this was the British Empire, which at its peak had the strongest navy and military. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the second theory of how to take over the world. And uh, on the next, we will focus on the third way to take over the world, Mackinder's Heartland Theory, as well as Spike Min's Rimland Theory for number four. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Hazem Kiro with Timeless Wisdom. Thank you and bon appetit.